Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Thursday, August the 20th. Today is the day the LCMS commemorates the life of Samuel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one in the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. Samuel, last of the Old Testament judges and first of the prophets after Moses, lived during the 11th century BC. The child of Elkanah and his wife Hannah, Samuel was from early on consecrated by his parents for sacred service and trained in the house of the Lord at Shiloh by Eli the priest. Samuel's authority as a prophet was established by God, 1 Samuel 3.20. He anointed Saul to be Israel's first king, 1 Samuel 10.1. Later, as a result of Saul's disobedience to God, Samuel, Samuel repudiated Saul's leadership and then anointed David to be king in place of Saul, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Samuel's loyalty to God, his spiritual insight, and his ability to inspire others made him one of Israel's great leaders. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is Part 4 of Article 4 on Justification in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. And just a reminder, there is no evening prayer tomorrow night. I've got a, a far out-of-town wedding rehearsal and then wedding on Saturday. 
So uh, no evening prayer tomorrow, but we will have morning prayer. And then we'll begin again on Monday with part five of Article 4. Article 4, part 4, beginning in paragraph 57. Throughout the prophets and the Psalms, this worship, this latria, is highly praised even though the law does not teach the free forgiveness of sins. The Old Testament fathers knew the promise about Christ, that God for Christ's sake wanted to forgive sins. They understood that Christ would be the price for our sins. They knew that our works are not a price for so great a matter. So they received free mercy and forgiveness of sins by faith, just as the saints in the New Testament. To this point belong those frequent repetitions about mercy and faith that appear in the Psalms and the Prophets. For example, Psalm 133 says, If you, O Lord, could mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Here David confesses his sins and does not list his merits. He adds, But with you there is forgiveness. Verse 4. Here he comforts himself by his trust in God's mercy, and he refers to the promise, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Verse 5. This means because you have promised the forgiveness of sins, I am sustained by your promise. Therefore the fathers also were justified, not by the law, but by the promise and faith. It is amazing that the adversaries diminish faith to such a degree, even though they see that it is every word praised as a great service. For example, Psalm 5015 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. God wants himself to be known. He wants himself to be worshipped, so that we receive benefits from him and receive them because of his mercy, not because of our merits. This is the richest consolation in all afflictions. The adversaries ban such consolation when they diminish and disparage faith and teach only that by means of works and merits, people interact with God. Faith in Christ justifies. Editor's note. While the Roman Church does not bypass Christ or God's grace, it does base its doctrine of justification on our cooperation with God's grace, rather than on Christ's work alone. Inclination toward goodness is increased by participation in the Church's sacramental system, whereby we receive grace from the merits of Christ and the saints. Through our cooperation with this grace, we earn eternal life. This teaching is subtly and deceptively nuanced and must be exposed as false and potentially damning, Galatians 3, 10 to 14. It diverts our eyes from Christ and his full, complete, and perfect satisfaction for sins. Through careful analysis of religious terms and their use, Melanchthon shows that the Roman Catholic teaching on justification is contrary to Holy Scriptures that it confuses grace and works, and that it obscures the merit and glory of Christ. Faith in Christ justifies. In the first place, let anyone think that we speak about an idle knowledge of history. We must state how faith is obtained. Afterward, we will show both that faith justifies and how this ought to be understood. We will also explain the objections of the adversaries. Christ, in the last chapter of Luke, commands that repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name, Luke 24, 47. The gospel convicts all people that they are under sin, that they are subject to eternal wrath and death. It offers, for Christ's sake, forgiveness of sin and justification, which is received through faith. The preaching of repentance, which accuses us, terrifies consciences with true and grave terrors. In these matters, hearts ought to receive consolation again. This happens if they believe Christ's promise that for his sake we have forgiveness of sins. This faith, encouraging and consoling in these fears, receives forgiveness of sins, justifies, and gives life. For this consolation is a new birth and spiritual life. These things are plain and clear and can be understood by the pious. They also have testimonies of the church. The adversaries cannot say how the Holy Spirit is given. They imagine that the sacraments give the Holy Spirit by the outward act, ex opere operato, without a good emotion in the one receiving them, as though indeed the gift of the Holy Spirit were a useless matter. We speak of the kind of faith that is not an idle thought, but that liberates from death and produces a new life in hearts. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This does not coexist with mortal sin. As long as faith is present, it produces good fruits, as we will explain later. 
about the conversion of the wicked or about the way of regeneration, what can be said that is simpler and clearer? Let the scholastics from so great a host of writers produce a single commentary upon the sentences that speaks about the way of regeneration. When they speak of the habit of love, they imagine that people merit it through works. They do not teach that it is received through the word. They teach just like the Anabaptists teach at this time. But God cannot be interacted with, God cannot be grasped, except through the word. So justification happens through the word, just as Paul says in Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Likewise, he says in 1017, faith comes from hearing. Proof can be derived even from this. Faith justifies because if justification happens only through the word and the word is understood only by faith, it follows that faith justifies. There are other and more important reasons. We have said these things so far in order that we might show the way of regeneration and that the nature of faith, what faith is or is not about which we speak, might be understood. Now we will show that faith justifies in nothing else. Here in the first place, readers must be taught about this point. Just as it is necessary to keep this statement, Christ is mediator, so it is necessary to defend that faith justifies. For how will Christ be mediator if we do not use him as mediator in justification? if we do not hold that we are counted righteous for his sake. To believe is to trust in Christ's merits, that for his sake God certainly wishes to be reconciled with us. Here is a similar point. Just as we should defend that the promise of Christ is necessary apart from the law, so also we should defend that faith justifies. For the law cannot be performed unless the Holy Spirit is received first. It is therefore necessary to defend that the promise of Christ is necessary but this cannot be received except through faith. Therefore, those who deny that faith justifies teach nothing but the law, both Christ and the gospel being set aside. When it is said that faith justifies, some perhaps understand it to mean that faith is the beginning of justification or the preparation for justification. Then it is not faith through which we are accepted by God, but the works that follow. So they dream that faith is highly praised because it is the beginning. For great is the importance of the beginning, as they commonly say, the beginning is half of everything. They speak as if one would say that grammar makes the teacher, teachers of all arts because it prepares for other arts. In fact, it is one's own art that makes everyone an artist. We do not believe like this about faith, but we hold, properly and truly, we are for Christ's sake counted righteous, or are acceptable to God through faith itself. To be justified means that just people are made out of unjust people, or born again. It also means that they are pronounced or counted as just, for Scripture speaks in both ways. So we wish to show this first. Faith alone makes a just person out of an unjust person. In other words, that person receives forgiveness of sins. And we will continue with part five on Monday night. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But, ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled, and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. 
Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood and let all your faithful people ever be found in the apostles' doctrine in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another, to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, in your mercy you gave Samuel courage to call Israel to repentance and to renew their dedication to the Lord. Call us to repentance as Nathan called David to repentance. So by the blood of Jesus, the son of David, we may receive the forgiveness of all our sins. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.